Szanowni Państwo, pomimo tego, że w poprzedniej... In the previous lecture, you have heard about the next duty we have to add to our list. It's the duty of being optimistic. And I think it's rather nice. So now we will try to sadden you a little bit. But of course, it's a joke. Uh, we will be talking about patriotism, about citizen and nation, uh, whether the liberal patriotism can be stronger than national attachment. One patriotism or many patriotisms uh, uh, match uh, the contemporary world. Uh, the uh, speech will be delivered by Mark Lira, philosopher, historian of ideas, publicist, and a professor at Columbia University. Professor, the floor is yours. On the 23rd of this year, I received an invitation to attend these Freedom Games and speak about citizenship and nationalism. The next morning, Russian troops rolled into Ukraine. So where to begin? The Ukrainian response to the Soviet invasion has been somewhat embarrassing for those of us in the rest of the West. We're used to living in peace and prosperity and are not in the habit of fighting for our way of life or making sacrifices for the common good. And so today we find ourselves asking whether under similar circumstances we would be as courageous and unselfish as the Ukrainians have proved themselves to be. And no sooner do we ask ourselves this question than a blush rises to our cheeks. Perhaps we're being too hard on ourselves. Crises can inspire people to do uncharacteristic things. I hope you'll forgive me for pointing out that Ukraine has never previously been considered a model democracy committed to liberal principles, nor were its citizens known for their sense of fraternity and civic responsibility. Very few observers could have predicted the surge of resistance that followed the Russian invasion. Vladimir Putin was not alone. But how long this feeling will last after the war is over is anyone's guess. There are uh, historical examples of war changing the, what you might call the DNA of nations. And post-war Germany is a dramatic example of just that kind of transformation. But as we know from our personal relations, the camaraderie that gets forged by a crisis tends to dissipate over time. There is a law of entropy in human relations, just as there is entropy in the physical world. There is even such a thing as moral entropy. One can only expect people to be good for so long. But at this moment, and it's a precious moment, the resistance of the Ukrainians and their sense of solidarity is an, is an inspiration for the rest of us in the West. But to some, it's even more than that. They're beginning to look for a lesson already in Ukraine at war, a lesson that sheds uh, our own countries in a, in a darker light. Already certain liberal intellectuals are holding up the example of Ukraine at war in order to criticize their own societies. They're asking themselves, why can't we be more like Ukraine today? Now, this is not a wise question, but it arises out of a genuine concern about our democratic societies. There's a common feeling that we've lost a sense of civic purpose, that democratic norms are being openly flouted, and that there's a chilling indifference to the public good. Seen from a certain angle, our countries look less like republics of citizens today than assemblies of consumers and web surfers glued to their screens. 
And meanwhile, of course, a xenophobic nationalism is replacing a generous patriotism that once reflected optimism about the democratic prospect. And so, yes, why can't we be Ukraine? A good example of this line of questioning comes from David Brooks, who is a, one of the most sober and intelligence journalists working in the United States. Last week in the New York Times, he wrote the following. He said, the war in Ukraine is not only a military event, it's an intellectual event. The Ukrainians are, winning, are not only winning because of the superiority of their troops, they're winning because they're fighting for a superior idea. Now, as Brooks goes on to say, that idea is liberal nationalism. He believes that Ukraine is teaching us that a feeling of national belonging need not contradict a commitment to individual liberty. On the contrary, liberalism can ennoble nationalism, teaching it to be generous. And an elevated nationalism can connect liberal principles to our feelings of attachment to each other and inspire us to fight for what we share. And so let us all be liberal nationalists now. This is an admirable wish, and I actually share it. But it begs the following question. Why are we not liberal nationalists today? Why is there so little concern for the public good in contemporary democracies? Why are we such indifferent citizens? And why has, on the contrary, illiberal nationalism acquired such appeal? Now, rather than try to answer these difficult questions, it's much easier to charge Western liberal Democrats and democracies with a failure of nerve, an unwillingness to fight, now, one could write an interesting little book about the role that the charge of a, a failure of nerve uh, has played in modern politics. We usually associate it with re reactionary and militaristic uh, people on the right. One of the ironies, of course, in the present conflict is that Vladimir Putin, who often weaponized this charge, is now the target of it. Because of his military failures, his masculinity, his willingness to fight, has been thrown into question by the radical right that he helped create. But the charge has also been used on the left. Older Poles and Ukrainians in the audience today will remember how the phrase insufficient revolutionary zeal was used to explain failures of the regime or to purge troublesome public figures. Why, why have we not met the quotas set by the five-year plan? A lack of revolutionary zeal. Why has the collectivization of farms caused famine? A lack of revolutionary zeal. Behind the magical economic thinking of Marxism-Leninism was a theory of the will to power. Now, among the unfortunate habits that defenders of liberal democracy developed during the Cold War was to use similar rhetoric. If you look back to the writings of the period, it's striking how often the words faith and war appear. We must have faith in democratic principles. We must win the war of ideas. Now, it's understandable why liberals began to speak this way. After all, communism was a messianic faith, and communist intellectuals were not above using force to reach their ends. Not to mention the fact, of course, that communist regimes were a genuine military threat to liberal democracies. But let's remember, the only legitimate object of faith is a god, not an idea. And ideas are not weapons to serve armchair generals. Ideas are legitimate objects of reflection and criticism in the pursuit of truth. And that is all that they are. Ideologies, on the other hand, do inspire faith. 
and they can and sometimes must be employed in, in uh, political conflicts. But there is no such thing as a war of ideas. The real power of ideas is their capacity to unmask and undo ideologies, not propagate them. Now, those who are looking to Ukraine today in order to scold their own countries and their own populations are, generally, are genuinely worried about them. And I'm among this group of war warriors. In fact, I wrote a book to express my worries uh, a few years ago. But I do not think that the sorry state of our democratic societies has much to do with a failure of nerve or a loss of faith or confused ideas, or the lack of a single, uh, singular idea, like liberal nationalism. The older I get, the more materialist I become. Not a materialist in the sense of Karl Marx, but in the sense of Tocqueville. In recent years, I've been spending a lot of time with uh, Tocqueville, and I'm struck by the subtle and convincing uh, materialism one finds in the pages of his masterpiece, Democracy in America. That book does not begin with an invocation of democratic values and a call to fight for them and defend them. It begins with the geography of the United States, well, then North America, the forests, the swamps, the mountains, the rushing rivers, in the face of the vast, unspoiled American landscape, the early settlers from Europe found themselves in a state of relative equality. Nature was very big and they were very small, and so they needed each other. But in Tocqueville's view, it was this fact of equality that was a necessary condition for the establishing of the principle of equality in the United States. And it was that principle that then inspired a passion for equality, a feeling, a willingness to fight for it. So the lesson is that for passions to be alive, they in some way have to be rooted in material reality. Tocqueville, of course, did not believe, as Marx did, that political ideas just mirror the material relations in a society, but he knew that no political idea will seem convincing for long, or even relevant, if it is in obvious contradiction with social reality. This is the challenge that all utopian thinkers face. They somehow have to imagine a new state of affairs that doesn't seem totally alien but is somehow still recognizable to people in the present. So there's a very important correlate for us today uh, to be found in Tocqueville's materialism, and it's this. If political ideals that once captured people's imaginations no longer do, the intellectual's first instinct should be to examine what changes in social conditions might have made the old ideas less compelling than they once were. It should not be to adopt a prophetic pose and implore, implore everyone to return to the true faith. And so, if we're concerned, as we ought to be, about a lack of civic attachment in modern democracies, a lack of social solidarity and respect for the common good, we have to ask ourselves the following question. What has changed in the way we live now to erode our sense of democratic citizenship? Now, my own thinking about this question is not, I'm afraid, original. It seems to me that the ultimate source of democratic erosion is the fact that our societies have become more liquid and less solid, so, to adopt the terms of the Polish sociologist Sigmund Bauman. 
Baumann's use of the term liquid uh, was an oblique reference to the Communist Manifesto, where, as we all know, Marx and Engels said that under capitalism, all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned. Baumann pointed out that Marx and Engels thought that solidity in a society was actually a good thing. In this sense, they were conservatives. And their expectation was that once unstable capitalist societies were overthrown, a new solid type of society would emerge under communism. They did not preach permanent revolution. They were not Maoists. For them, the whole point of engaging in socialist and communist politics was to restore solidity and establish certainty in social relations in order to achieve justice. Hence, the importance of socialist values like solidarity and policies like economic planning. As we all know, this communist utopian dream is dead and capitalism remains in place. But its power to liquefy our human relations has massively increased. Capitalism in the wider sense, including modern science and technology, no longer eats away at traditional social institutions. It prevents new social institutions from forming. This, I think, was Baumann's most important insight. We now live in a world where people have begun to anticipate that fewer of our institutions and norms will endure as they once did. And they've begun to factor this into their thinking and even more importantly into their feelings. We know, for example, that children of divorced, uh, of divorced parents have uh, more trouble than most in developing social relations with others, having lost a sense of certainty about the family and the structure of their lives, uh, they lack the confidence to establish stable ones out of fear that they too will not last. Well, my sense is that this is a phenomenon that is happening in every social sphere today, more generally. As the human lifespan expands, increases rather, the lifespan of social institutions has been decreasing. That's a paradox. Today this means that fewer and fewer of the social institutions and norms that exist when a child is born will exist when that child is old. And if this trend continues, it is hard not to think that we are in store for some radical transformations both of human consciousness and of social life. Now, obvious examples of liquidity abound. I'll mention a few. In the economic sphere, deregulation, flexible labor markets, privatization, global finance and trade, the dismantling of social protections have made the lives of workers, and more importantly, I think, their communities more fragile. In the technological sphere, the unavoidable internet offers young people a vast array of human possibilities at a very young age, which has undermined the transmission of familial and national and religious customs and values. It has also subjected all of us to psychological and, moral, psychological and moral viruses that ricochet around the globe instantaneously. Another example, in the medical field, rapid advances in research and treatment render today's therapeutic wisdom, whatever it is, obsolete tomorrow. And this has left less educated people confused if they don't understand the scientific method and increasingly skeptical about the medical establishment. And finally, and most dramatically, we see the effects of liquidity 
in new ideologies of fluid psychosexual identities. This is an historically unprecedented situation. The nature of human society has always been conservative. That's a point of a society, to conserve. Its function has been to offer a stable environment in which individuals can develop psychologically and cooperate with each other. It also, crucially, transmitted knowledge and norms to subsequent generations. All of the ideas and institutions of liberal democracy developed in societies that functioned in this conservative way. But our liquid societies do all of this less well. Our societies are becoming, so to speak, less social. Their ener energy is, is centrifugal, forcing things apart rather than centripetal, forcing them together. Now, what I've just put forward is just a thesis, and it's not an original one. But if it is even half right, I think we need to engage in some uh, much deeper thinking about liberal democracy, about the nation, and about civic engagement than we are accustomed to. In an unstable environment where institutions and values have trouble getting rooted, just what does the term the common good mean? When the forces that determine human destinies are global and ever-changing, what does the phrase democratic citizenship mean? These are not intended to be rhetorical questions. To my mind, they are the, the fundamental political questions of our time. We need answers uh, to these questions before we can think clearly about much else. We cannot fight for liberal democracy or liberal nationalism if we don't know what democracy is still capable of, given the societies that we are now fated to live in. One final remark. Many people today are convinced that the greatest threat to liberal democracy is not fluidity, liquidity, it's rather nationalism. They're concerned about ideologies that want to make our societies less open, less subject to change, less diverse. I share this concern, at least in the short run. Today's self-declared illiberal nationalists are trouble and can cause a lot of damage. But what they cannot do is change the laws of social physics. The activists who gather in Budapest these days to hear the gospel of Christian integrism are children of liquid societies. Whatever their nostalgic fantasies about a world they've never known and that never existed in the form they imagine, their psychological outlook presumes liquidity, movement, change. They are bees who were born outside of a hive, and they are incapable of adjusting to living in one. The fact is that today's nationalists can never achieve their goals. History has erased the possibility of sustainable, integrated, homogeneous, theological political regimes. The Republic of Iran is an atavism, a blast from the past. It's not a vision of the future. The same is true of uh, the India of Narendra Modi. Now, we should be concerned about today's nationalists, and we should resist them politically. But I think that's because political movements that fail to achieve their ends are often more dangerous than movements that do. Now, given the 
current geological, uh, geopolitical situation, I wish I had brought a more hopeful message like my, like my predecessor up here. I would have liked to d deliver a sermon calling on the defenders of democracy to man the barricades and fight for our values. But the deeper forces that are at work in our societies today will have a more profound effect on us and on you and on the Ukrainians than the current situation will. If we really want to protect our democracies, our first task intellectually is to understand these forces, which are not local, they are not national, they're global. They're everywhere in the world today. For me, it was a revealing fact that in the early weeks of the current war, very few Russians uh, demonstrated against the war for understandable reasons. Even fewer demonstrated for the war or rushed to enlist in the military. Instead, what did most Russians do? They rushed to Ikea to buy furniture before the store closed for good. Thank you.